let's take a moment to talk about our sponsor. You're a new DM who wants to jump behind the screen. Maybe you've been volunteered by your gaming group, but aren't quite ready. You've been watching people play games online or on podcasts, and you're thinking to yourself, where do they come up with all that descriptive narrative? There's no way I can do that. Well, don't worry. We've got a solution for you. What if I were to tell you that I can put a team of professional writers alongside you at your desk while you're prepping your game? Sounds pretty good, huh? With Describe, we can do just that. These narratives vividly describe monsters, places, spells, people, you name it. It's there. And there are more than 6,000 of these easy-to-search-up, copy, and pasteable, beautifully written narratives right at your fingertips. Confidently read these narratives aloud in your campaign and impress noob and veteran gamer alike. And the best thing about it is, the library of narratives is constantly growing, and it's affordable. Describe has graciously provided us with a discount for our listeners. Head on over to describe.com backslash dmd. That's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com backslash DMD. Use the code DMD at checkout to try to describe for two weeks for free. Links will be in the show notes. And now, back to the show. Welcome to Baha'i Mirren, the campaign setting for our D&D actual play, An Acorn's Journey, a D&D story. You're probably wondering what this homebrew world is all about. Being new around these parts and all, well, step inside the visitor center so we can give you the basics and get you up to speed because it's our homebrew world. Hi, Murin. This week on the Dungeon Master's Dojo. Hello. And welcome to another episode of the Dungeon Masters Dojo Podcast. This is a show for game masters and players alike. We hope to bring you tips and tricks to elevate your game and develop the art of dungeon mastery. I'm your host, Louis Aponte, and these are your dungeon masters, Scott Labby and Bill Robitaille. Let's head to the dojo and see what they have in store for us today. I need to go on a world adventure. Well, welcome to High Mirren. If there's anything we can do to in- make your stay more enjoyable, just let us know. Okay, I get scared now. I'm thinking Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, just because you can create it doesn't mean you should. <laughs> well, let's hope they don't tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you did. It, it, w- it was interesting. It was, it was very, very interesting. It started from a whole series of conversations back and forth and... Let's, you know, we should do, and maybe one day we will, and how about if with this? And then we started looking at it considerably more seriously. And then, voila, we, we kind of like, let's do this. We still drank a lot. I mean, oh, we weren't yeah. that serious, but. <laughs> we had to we had to fuel those creative fires somehow. I know how much you guys drank. Trust me, I know. <laughs> I, I wonder if that's how God did it. <laughs> it's got together. Possible. Got together. Was, yeah. I don't know what this is, but it's making me feel kind of funny, and I, I think I want to create something. <laughs> Let's build a world. Let's build a world. <laughs> so why did we homebrew a world? Uh, we have a bunch of old, 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 like Lewis old gamers. Yeah. Who knew all about the Dark Sun campaign setting, the Mystara, Forgotten Realms, Eberron, Spelljammer. So no matter what we did, and and a few of them had committed most of the Monster Manual to memory. That's or, the biggest or, problem. Or pretty close. So we wanted to do... They had already played in all those worlds. We had already played in all those worlds ourselves and ran adventures there. So we wanted to give our players something brand new to explore when we go away on our week long adventure in, in February. And we're glad you did too. Well, part of it too is, you know, uh, we don't want to be throwing the same old thing at them. Boring. And and I think you and I started talking, we should make our own monsters. I think maybe that's somewhere's, around where it started. Yeah. Maybe we should just, you know, we started like reskinning monsters 
and so giving them abilities, taking abilities away, makes one thing look like another. So they thought they were fighting one monster, but it had different abilities altogether. I think that kind of started it. It, it. it was, and it was actually pretty funny because when we heard new monsters, our eyes got big like, you know, a cat looking at milk. And then we saw the monsters and our eyes watered. <laughs> we were scared. <laughs> I think one of the very first things you ran into was the Billicus. Yeah, we won't talk about that one. <laughs> yeah, I, in in our table was when we take our table on an adventure. It was it was like taking you know Jeff Corwin, Steve Irwin, Marlon Perkins, and Jim Fowler <laughs> out on a walkabout in yeah. nature. Yeah, they, we're gonna do a safari. <laughs> yeah, they knew everything. Yeah, so we had to. But then we're like, well, where are our monsters gonna live? Well, we got to build a world for them because inevitably you get the, this does not exist in the forgotten realms. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, that's not indigenous to this particular continent. It is it now. It couldn't possibly survive in this environment. Well, surprise. And we had, we had players that knew more about the campaign settings, much more about them than we did because <laughs> they owned every iteration of the campaign setting. And they devoured it. Like and a lot a, of them like were a game. fat guy does cake. <laughs> I should know. And uh, they read the books, the novels. Yeah, they went along with them. Yep. And there, a lot of them were game mastering their own tables as well. Yeah. Uh, so they, you know, they they dipped their toe into the the pool and sat in the big chair. And you know, this is how I do it. So yeah, we needed something to freshen it up. For our group. And that's how it all came about. So what's in our homebrew world? We got continents and stuff. Well, let's go over our continents. We have what, five major areas in the world. Yes. Of course, now I got to build a six, but. Yeah. Um, and what are you waiting for? <laughs> I mean, it's, we just ended yesterday. Yeah, you can't give us a chance to explore the rest of that lands. Are you going to jump on this this bandwagon, no, Mister? No, I got to, uh, Mister. I got to edit all this stuff. You going to jump on that bandwagon? He, okay, he's not, no, <laughs> there's no no chance you'll get Lewis to put forth that degree of effort. Uh, <laughs> let's let's start off with our primary continent, where everything kind of spun off of. Yes, and that would be Kern, the big the big one, kind of sorta, kind of sorta. K U R N, Kern. That, that's where most most of the people live. Yes, it has the largest population. It's where yeah. our where our, we featured the the sundering of our continent and split it, cracked it right down the middle, and left an, a bit of a an annoyance for people to get up and down over this giant cliff that went from coast to coast. It tends to be the most diverse. It does. It does. Well, that it was the refuge after the uh, what we call the sundering, um, and because well, where they came from kind of blowed up. But we'll get into that in a couple bit, a couple minutes. But so they all kind of headed here because it was the largest and, and the least amount of damage was done to Kern. So I think that's what where a lot of the races ended up here and then evolving here. Yeah, they either came across from other places or they came up from the underworld. Yes, the depths of the world. And then we have the Skylands. That used to be a continent, but yes. they're floating islands in the sky. The, the Cataclysm was was magical in nature uh individuals toying with magics far too powerful for them to control they weren't they weren't learned enough to be toying with that degree of magic and they blew the continent that they lived on to smithereens and now there's these massive floating islands in the ocean and there's swirling magical energy at the bases which hold them aloft and who knows what's up in them? No one knows because none of our players have been there yet. Maybe someday. Chomping at the bit. They desperately, it's a floating island. They got to get up there. You guys can explore it with us. That would be fun. That would be cool. Then we have uh, the rest of the continent that blew up. The stuff that didn't sink or get shot didn't, into the air. Or shot into the air floating around, which is Perth and the seeds of the world. Perth is kind of the largest landmass of this of this group it's a a, a bit of a, a good size um other massive island or small continent 
kind of Australia like. Yeah, yeah, very much so. But around it and off to the uh, western side is the Seeds of the World, which is a string of smaller islands that have uh, uh, once again the the remnants of the continent that didn't quite sink and definitely didn't make it, make it into the air. And that's where the Perthian peoples live, yes. which was probably the the original uh, group of people of the world. Yes, because they're very different than the they're humans, but they're very different in appearance than other other humans. Their their skin is very dark black, and their eyes tend to be very light in color. They're a beautific people, mm-hmm. tall, slender, li- you know, lithe, high cheekbones. Uh, the women are beautiful. The men handsome, and they are they are a a race of explorers and adventurers. So you'll see they'll their sailing vessels on the ocean. And trading with with Kern and the the large the big island. Mm-hmm. Then we move on to Zvajir. Yes, the beast that walks the world. It is a massive ice flow, and the Valrakian people live there. They're descendants of the giants, so they're large, hardy individuals, giants in their own right, uh, standing between eight and nine feet tall. They're, they're explorers and fishermen and a very hardy group of people. Their cousins, the Barakians, live on the continent of Kern in the north. The, the Valrakians are not as warlike as their cousins. They're less hot-headed. Well, they have less people to fight with. <laughs> they're yes. on a giant ice floe. Um, and the, the reason they call it the beast that walks the world, it's an ice floe that's so massive it actually the bottom of it drags along the, the sea floor. But as weather builds one end, it breaks off the other. And it seems as if every couple hundred years, well, four or 500 years, it actually circumnavigates the, the northern pole. So there are times where it's a very long trip to get back to Kern, and other times where it's relatively close. So it depends on where in the cycle it is. But there's a, a, a good amount of time that, it can't even be seen from the shore because it's hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Then there's the southern continent of Pellerith. That is a, an inhospitable Arctic climate. Rock spires reaching to the sky, little to no vegetation except around the shorelines. Uh, ice and snow are everywhere. Glaciers dot their way through the mountaintops. It's a, like you said, a horribly um, (laughs) inhospitable, what the hell, why can't I talk? Inhospitable. Inhospitable. It's the mustache. It is. It gets in the way of my upper lip and my lower lip and in my teeth. But it's epic looking. Yeah, so it, but there are creatures out in those rocks and the snow that are horrific. I don't know where they came from. (laughs) The trolls live there too. The, the trolls, trolls were a a slave race bred for servitude by the Tiana Rook. They waged a rebellion. They had made they had they'd used eugenics to develop these creatures and they waged a rebellion. They were too much to handle, so they released all the different species of troll out to the surface with the expectation that they would die. Which they did not. They didn't. So you have trolls are big to begin with. They're about the size of the 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 giants of the north. But then, but then there's the really big, big, big trolls that you might think of uh, when you hear about Scandinavian stories, and um, those are lurking about in the mountains of Pellerinth. There's one city, slave city. Yes, we have slavery in our world. We added that because slavery sucks. Slavery sucks. And you got to have bad guys. So there is a, a large city that trades with some of the other nations of Kern in, in the slave trade. They have to get resources somehow because they live on a giant frozen rock. And that's how they go about it. Um, that's the continent that we have up to this point. There, there is probably a sixth un- inevitably coming, as we mentioned earlier, but I'll build that first chance I get. 
tomorrow. <clears throat> yes, sir. God, you sound like Lou now. All right, so we move on to the magic of our world. We have magic. Oh, it's yeah. It's just regulated. Yes, it, it, it's severely regulated, actually. Yes. There are two entities that watch magic. One actively seeking it out. The other one counsels sternly, I might say. But the one that actively seeks it out um, resides in the towers of the mages. It's a little corner of the world where the mages dedicated to each form of magic has their own tower and they have what they call the shroud. And these are the shock troopers that go out and collect magic because magic blew up the world and they are still terrified of it thousands of years later because they don't want it to happen again. And if someone or something or organization, a group, a city, an individual has what they deem too much magic and draws attention to themselves, they will send out agents of the shroud to collect it and take it and put it away where it's safe. And a user of magic in an adventuring party was either trained with this, this organization called the Concilium at one of their universities of magic, or they were trained in the, uh, underground so to speak by an outlaw user of magic so some sorcerers may have come up being tutored by a sorcerer outside of the concilium some of the wizards may have been may have learned their use of magic through an outlaw wizard or they may have attended one of the universities of magic that's regulated by the concilium because even your your advancement in magic is watched carefully as well by the concilium. And there are, at the very high levels, only a few allowed at that level. And you have to challenge someone from a higher level to gain that level and displace them from their seat in the concilium in order to step up to that level. Difficult process. The other set of, of individuals that kind of keep an eye on magic, more in a counseling, is divine magic users. They have a set of towers as well devoted to the alignments. And so then the other group that keeps an eye on the magic, but more in a consultant style, is the conclave. And this is the group of um, divine magic users. Each tower has its own alignment. Then you have the central tower, which is a tower of roses, which is inhabited by the Rose Warden that oversees it. And then you have their council as well. And like the mages, you have to, as you move up into the higher levels, you have to challenge someone of a higher level and displace them to take their place. And that's how you work your way up as well, which also helps put a bit of a damper on really high level uh, player characters. Um, We do, like I said, we do police our magic in our world and even with the players now granted we're gonna let the players have a shot at it and sometimes they might make it and sometimes they don't but those are the two organizations that keep an eye on the magic and they have their own protectors as well but more a um instead of shock troopers more like a police and that that, that's the phoenix guard and those are the uh it's almost like the papal army very much like the people and it was it was stylized after that a bit so the indigenous people of the area, which is on Perth, um, make up that that uh, police force that keeps an eye and protects the towers, but also takes care of any uh, necessary intervening or or uh, mingling with the the real world out there beyond their towers. What? No halflings? No halflings. Did away with them. Threw them off the planet. They may be somewhere in orbit but they're going to burn up on re-entry. Yeah. Yeah, they already started. One just landed in the backyard. Oof. Why no halflings? Ah, there's halflings everywhere. Yeah, it's it's, I, it's way overdone. And I want my halflings to be like hobbits. And I think that's like a copyright infringement or something, right? <laughs> Dude, yeah, there's some kind of uh, issue with that, or at least there has in the past, and we're not stepping into that, that ring whatsoever. So, yeah, uh, we did away with the halflings. Yeah. We have enough little people running around. We have our own little people that we created ourselves. The heck with it. 
Um, we're going to stick with that. We'll go over them later, but maybe we'll go over them later. Well, they may get their own episode at a later time. Who knows? Yeah, we'll hold them off for their own episode. Then. Yeah. We'll do that. So, yeah, they're gone. What? No dragons either? They're a nuisance. They break things. They poo real large. You can't, you can't have any sort of livestock because they just come and gobble them up. And they're known to like crash almost every wedding that's outdoors. Yeah. They're just, I mean, they're, and they're mean. They're mean. Yeah. Uh, a little self-centered. The dragons take on an earthly form or the gods take on an earthly form of a dragon. Now there's some dragons left, but they're, they're, they're kind of a declining race. Yeah. They, they're not as beautiful. Way back when in our timeline, there there were dragons. There were full giants. There was all kinds of critter. And then there was a whole bunch of wars. Yeah, they couldn't get along. They Yeah, they just, you know, tomato, tomato. Um, and then they went war to one another and pretty much decimated them, themselves. Then when they were weakened, other races came in and went, you know, I'm tired of these really big things telling us what to do. Let's get rid of the rest of them. Yeah, eat my stuff and crashing weddings and yeah, just so r- they, burning fire. They did a pretty fire. efficient job of of calling out pretty much all the others, and the few that were left hid. Yeah, and now clutches of you know that those last remaining dragons when they have clutches of eggs, they hatched as um, dragonborn or kobolds. Mm-hmm. Um, so the race has been steadily declining. Um, and, but now, now we have kobolds and they're way nicer for the most part. I like a kobold. I like to play one of those one time. Yeah. You may, you might get a chance. That'd be cool. I know we did a review of them and I was, I kind of liked them. They're not dog face anymore. Yeah. I, I missed the little, the dog, um, looking kobolds as a dog lover myself. I would really enjoy a pet dog faced kobold. I'd name him Roy. Roy? Yeah. Any significance to naming him Roy or just... Kobolds just look like Roy's. Oh, I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Or Bertram. Yeah, 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 Bertram would work well, too. Yeah, I I can see that. Yeah. So I think we'll hold off the rest. I mean, we have more here, but let's hold that off for another episode, shall we? Yeah, let's do that. And that's our homebrew world. I'm Aaron. We'll see you next time in the dojo. That's going to conclude this episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Please subscribe to the podcast for more great content. If you'd like to hear a particular topic, you can reach us out on Facebook at the Dungeon Masters Dojo. Or you can drop us an email at the Dungeon Masters Dojo at gmail.com. Thank you and have a good day.